time out of your Saturday morning to spend it with us for the next hour. Um, we are really pleased to have you here. I just want to introduce myself. My Christie House is I'm a faculty member last year. Um, I teach and supervise in a joint master's of nutrition and clinical health psychology program. And I want to introduce just Ann Curtis is a third year student in this program. And Mackenzie Dejan is an alum. She graduated in the spring and is currently practicing in the community nutritional counseling. So we prepared um, what we hope is a fun, interactive, and informative session today on uh, exploring <coughs> body image and challenging concepts of weight discrimination and bias. And really, Anne and Mackenzie are responsible for putting this outline together and the session they work really hard and collaborated long hours to put a session together that will hopefully increase your awareness about body image and and hopefully give you some actually practical strategies that you can take home with you after you leave to continue to improve your own body image and challenge some weight discrimination and bias that exists and we'll talk more about that as we go on. How many folks have come to the Bastier Center for Natural Health Living Series. How many are regular attendees? Okay, how many are new? All right, well, what we wanted to do, we've got a group, if you can come up in the front, we just wanted to um, introduce yourself to a neighbor. So we're gonna be doing some group work and um, as a community, so if you can just say hi to someone you haven't met, introduce your name. So uh, hopefully you'll make a new friend by the end of our time today. We're going to be doing some more sharing. Um, and we're going to be doing some individual exercises, a small group, and kind of a, uh, some discussion as a group. Um, when we talk about body image, we're going to, and body size and shape, there's a lot of words that, that, that we collectively use to describe that, the continuum from thin, fat, overweight, obese, people of size. And we encourage you to, as you hear these words that we're going to be talking about today that describe shape and image, to just pay attention to your own reactions to the words. That sometimes your reactions to how we describe body image can be cues to uh, your own beliefs and assumptions about what body image might mean to you. And that's one of the things we really want to help you do today is increase your self-awareness around this topic. Um, just a few things about being together as a group. Since we're gonna be doing some discussion, we ask uh, you agree to some community agreements. When we talk uh, an atmosphere of dialogue versus debate, sharing, and exchanging ideas versus trying to kind of get your point across. Um, talking from your own experience can be talking about your own thoughts, feelings, behaviors, I think, I feel, I did, um, and allowing other people uh, to share their experiences and their own truth and reality. Step up, step up means if you tend to, in a group, contribute a lot. Step up, you're listening, and if in a group you tend to and it stand back and listen more, we encourage you to step up your participation. Um, and of course, there might be differences of opinion, and that is uh, actually one of the great things about getting a group of different people, diverse people in a room talking about a topic, but we do encourage you to avoid blaming and tacking and shaming. So these are just some things that can help create an atmosphere of inclusivity. And finally, um, one of the things that you'll see that will, our images and some of our examples are geared towards women, but we actually know that uh, both men and women uh, are equally impacted uh, by struggles with body image. So um, we encourage the men in the room to also take what you can from our examples, even if they are presented from uh, a woman's perspective. All right. Okay, thank you. So we're gonna start out uh, with a little warm up. Um, so we're gonna sort of like limber up our awareness of 
of our own implicit perceptions and the kinds of attitudes that we have that we might not even be aware of. So the first thing I'm going to ask you to do is look in those folders and grab the beige card that has numbers one through six and then the letters A and D. Okay. So what we're going to do is look at a series of six paired images and I'm going to ask you really quickly to notice your first impression. So we're going to have a slide, I'll show you in a second. It'll have images of two different people, and there'll be a characteristic um, that's described on that slide, right? So it'll be a word or phrase that says something about um, a characteristic. And what I want you to do is first impression, top of your head, no thinking about it, just first impression. Which of those two people do you think is more likely to have that characteristic? We're gonna go through this really fast. So we'll do, look at number one, and you'll decide A or B. Each of them is, is labeled, right? So look at a slide, two images, one labeled A, one labeled B, and you're gonna pick which one of those you think is more likely to have that characteristic. We're gonna move right on to the next slide. So you're just gonna mark next to each of the numbers um, which letter you think is more likely to have that characteristic, and then we'll have time to, to talk about it. There are absolutely no right answers. This is not a test, right? Just a warm up exercise to get a sense of, of how we respond to images. Okay, any questions? Ready? It's gonna be fast. Okay, get your pen out. Okay, first one. Which of these two people do you think is more likely have just gotten promoted? Okay, mark your answer. On to the next one. Which one of these two people do you think is more active? Okay. Next one. Which one of these two people do you think is more likely to suffer from depression? Next one. Which of these two people do you think is more likely to be a better parent? Mm. <laughs> Next one. Which one of these people do you think is less organized? And last one. Which one of these two people is healthier? Okay. okay. So as we look at these images, first thing I'd like you to, to think about is how many of you actually just knew this <coughs> size? How many of you, when you looked at these images, one of the things that you were sort of aware of on some level was the size and shape of the person's body? Um, and if you look at your responses on the, the card, right, count the number of your responses that match up with these. Right? Well, I'm not supposed to say one through six, but, but <laughs> so one, two, three, four, five, six. See which one of those matches up. And if you have four or more that match up. So I really invite you to, to sort of think about um, what went into those perceptions, right? Because we asked you to do this off the top of your head, right? No right answers. This is not about what you think if you stop and consider it. It's what your first reaction is. And if you think about the characteristics that we asked you to consider, most of them are things that maybe we can't really know about a person just by looking at them. And yet, when you're forced to, in a, in a really quick response kind of moment, we have some kind of reaction to, to those ideas, right? Um, so we might think about uh, someone's success in their job, it might be on a subconscious level associated with what they look like, how active they are, what their mood is like, um, what their parenting is like, how their, or their level of organization, or how healthy they are, just based on those sort of initial snap kind of perceptions. Um, so if, you, if your numbers, if your answers kind of matched up with the um, with the responses that we had on the screen, you're certainly not alone, right? Um, because there is a really interesting study, a test that was developed by some researchers at Harvard um, called the Implicit uh, Attitudes um, Test. And uh, that was designed to help us understand how we respond to, uh, to connotations, right? To ways that we notice things um, that we're not even consciously aware of. So in this test, what they ask people to do is under time conditions, so super fast, make connections between ideas about weight or words about weight and positive or negative words. Right? And it turns out that we're much better at under time conditions, again, not consciously, but subconsciously, we're much better at making connections between words that are about weight, so fat and negative words, than thin and negative words. And we're much better at making association between thin and positive words than thin and negative words. Right? Um, and so again, this is not about what we're consciously thinking. This is something that's really pervasive, that we all have these, these kinds of responses. Okay. So 
Mackenzie's going to talk a little bit about how this works in our society. Okay. Thanks, Anne. So um, Christy and Anne introduced us to this idea, and Christy mentioned weight discrimination, discrimination and weight bias. And I'd like to take just a few minutes to go through those. And what do those really, really mean? And so you know, weight discrimination can be defined as you know, people of size that encounter discriminatory behaviors and are denied equal opportunities in many aspects of their lives. Okay, and so this is becoming more apparent. Um, the National Association of Advanced Fat Acceptance reported that weight discrimination was reported by 7% of U.S. adults in 1995 and 96, and almost doubled to 12% by 2006. So this is becoming more apparent in our society more and more. Okay, so it's these behaviors or actions that people of size are subject to. And so we're seeing that people of size are often denied job opportunities and or job advancement. People of size are more likely to be of a lower socioeconomic status. Um, people of size are subject to harassment about their weight by employers. People of size are systemically denied health insurance or pay higher premiums. And there's several more that are being studied and shown today. And then there's this other term as weight bias. So if weight discrimination are the behaviors, you know, weight bias is more the cognitive beliefs and behaviors that we have about weight. Okay, so weight bias can be defined as unfair favoritism or prejudicial beliefs based on a person's weight. And now this impacts all of us. All of us are impacted by these stereotypes in society, regardless of our size. All sizes and shapes have a stereotype. For example, you know, people size are maybe seen as lazy, or people size are maybe seen as lacking self-discipline, or um, have a defect in character or intelligent intelligence. Is maybe a stereotype for people size, where. People who are thin also have stereotypes, that they assume that maybe they're happy, or there's associations that thin people are successful or models of self-discipline. So this really impacts all of us. And if this is new to you, or you know, maybe you're aware of this and finally we're putting terms to it, you, know, you, can, you can think of this as also, you know, we have identifiers. Um, you know, we have race, we have ethnicity, we have our sexual orientation, um, maybe we're members of certain religion. All of these identifiers have had, or still have today, discriminatory beliefs or discriminatory behaviors and biases. And we're seeing now that weight is one of them. So overall, weight bias are these cognitive behaviors and beliefs that, like Anne mentioned, we might not necessarily be fully aware of or conscious of, yet they are occurring. And they can lead to behaviors that we're seeing and studying today that we mentioned, maybe people of size or, you know, not advancing as well in the workplace, for example. So just a quote I, that we would like to share with you today that really gets at this point of how weight bias affects all of us, okay? So the quote is from Health at Every Size. Health at Every Size is a movement that, unfortunately, due to our limited time today, we won't be able to get into, but it is on your reference form inside your packet. I encourage you to look into it if you're interested. It's exactly what it says, health at every size. And the quote that we want to share is that, as long as it's more difficult to live in a fat body, so society, our society today makes it difficult to live in a fat body based on these biases and discrimination. So as long as it's more difficult to live in a fat body, everyone fears becoming fat. The internalization of the belief that thinness is better drives the body anxiety that most people, fat or thin, experience. It fuels our preoccupation with obtaining or maintaining that ideal weight and elicits feelings of shame if we don't. It also supports the development of an eating disorder. So today's program is titled 
Breaking Body Myths. And, and we picked this title for a reason. You know, so a myth can be defined as a false narrative that explains how humankind came to be in its present form. Today, all of us are subject to a story, a narrative, that is being displayed 24 hours a day in billboards, magazines, TV, etc., about what our body should look like, about what a successful body looks like, about what a worthy body looks like, a beautiful body looks like. So we're all subject to this message, 24 hours a day, this story. So I'd like to turn now to, um, you know, really exploring this idea of what is the story or the narrative, the myth that we are hearing 24 hours a day about what a beautiful body looks like in our society. Okay, so please open up your packets. In your packets, you will find a blank, you know, five by seven card. And go ahead with a, a partner next to you, behind you, in front of you. Um, please brainstorm the end of this sentence. The ideal body in the US is. And go ahead and just make a list of things that come to mind. And go ahead and do it together in, in Paris. And we'll spend a couple of minutes just doing that. <coughs> with I just you know kind of popcorn style go ahead and just go ahead and share just maybe some things that we came up with the ideal body in the US is thin. is what thin, thin. Mm. Caucasian. Caucasian athletic tall athletic proportional. proportional well we've got quite a list here, that really gets at this, this, this myth. And you know, it's really neat that um, all of these you know, are, are very true and we see them every day. And it, it's interesting to see those identifiers that I spoke of, of you know, we all have identifiers, weight, you know, ethnicity, race, age, sexual orientation. You know, there's some overlap here. You know, that this, ideal body in the US is all these things, plus there's a certain race involved, there's a certain age involved. Um, there's a certain, you know, this fast, disease-free body, you know, you don't see anyone in a wheelchair that's much, that's representing this ideal body. Nobody said young, that's a bias. Young, yeah. Well, I, right, and this ageless. Oh, ageless. Yeah. Just this Immortal. And you must have all your hair. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great. All your teeth. All your teeth. Mm -hmm. All your teeth. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, thanks for compiling that list. That's great. So, where, where do we get these, right? This idea that, that the ideal body is thin, ideal body is curvy but only in the right places, right? It's sort of this image of uh, this, because I think most of us didn't wake up yesterday or last week and say, this is what I'm going to think is the ideal body image, right? It comes from somewhere. Um, and part of where it comes from is our culture. Uh, but it's hard to see that when you're in the culture, right? So it's hard to see the, the forest when you're in amongst the trees. So sometimes it's actually easier to see how these ideas are created and sometimes how artificial they are when we look at a different time or place. Yeah. So uh, one of the things that I find fascinating in, in thinking about this is thinking about foot binding. Um, because here we have a place where small is beautiful. But it's a very different idea of what's supposed to be small than maybe what we have right now. Right? So this idea that small, tiny little feet um, are beautiful in, in some way. Right? So this is the idea of the golden lotus, right? that, that the ideal, most perfect, female foot is three inches big. So three inches, 
three inches. That's the golden lotus, right? Oh, that this yeah. is something that for the vast majority of, of humans is not possible, right? It can only be artificially constructed. In order to, uh, to create these tiny, small, three-inch feet, um, the, the process, again, is, was a crippling for, for women, right? That, that this involved um, bending the toes over, in many cases, breaking them, um, binding them over years, and, and so women, in effect, were not able to walk. And think about, again, so how in the world this idea that, that small feet are somehow better? And not only are they better visually, um, and this happened for centuries, but they also get tangled up in all these ideas about who the person is, right? So if you have tiny, small, beautiful feet, then you're also virtuous, and you're also elegant, and you're also marriageable. And through much of the, the time period that we're talking about, there was a group of uh, people, the Hakka, whose women did not find their feet. And they were scorned and called big-feeted women, right? So the idea was that if you have the artificially constructed tiny little feet, then that's beautiful and normal, right? And if you have the feet that, that people are born with and, and develop for the vast majority of, of people, then those are enormous, right? So, so big feet are the feet that people would just have if they weren't, if they weren't altered, right? So this idea of, of, of artificiality, and I think this is why it's such a fascinating example to me, because we can look and say, that seems so strange. Like, why in the world would we think that small feet are beautiful? or that make you virtuous, or make you more marriageable. And yet, are there ways that we do some of the same thing, we have some of the same ideas? Um, so how do we create these artificial ideas right here and now, right? What kinds of things What the year span that? So, several centuries, um, up until the 1900s, yeah. Started about the 1600s and 1900s. Different, different places to different extents. Um, and no one's really sure why it started. There are different myths about why it, why it started. Can you tell um, us one of them? Mm -hmm. One of the myths? One of the myths was that, that uh, Golden Lotus was the name of, of a concubine of an emperor, um, and that she danced, um, having bound her feet sort of like, like uh, toe shoes in ballet, and that she had bound her feet, and that there were sort of poets who had written about the, the beauty of her feet. Um, probably that one incident didn't lead to 300 years of people choosing to, to do this, right? And this whole cultural idea that small is, is beautiful. In this in this way, right? Probably much more caught up in different ideas um, about uh, about controlling bodies and what controlling bodies allows you to do in a in a culture. Did high heel shoes go along with this? Really interesting, right? Yeah. yeah. So what does that mean? How do we having having even in our culture right now having feet that sort of look the way feet look um, is is not considered as attractive as feet that fit into a different kind of, of shape. Right? So it's a really good connection that you're making to. Uh, to what happens now. So let's look at some other ways that um, that we have to maybe change the way we are in order to fit some of these ideals that you guys uh, generated. So we wanted to just ask you to kind of reflect for a moment on on what the experience of, of watching that is like. Because you were starting to say, every time I see every that. Every time I see it, goosebumps. Yeah. Goosebumps? What sense What's of, that? Goosebumps? Yeah, just. I thought she was pretty to begin with. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But I use the word pretty, you see. That's interesting, even how the language that we use kind of calls up those ideas. And think about it, these are the people. That, that we've sort of designated as the most beautiful in our society, the models that we put up on these giant billboards and say, this is, this is the ideal. And even they don't, don't look like, like models, don't look like the, the pictures. In fact, um, average American woman, four feet, uh, five feet, four inches tall, weighs 140 pounds. Average American model, 5'11", weighs 117 yeah, pounds. Wow. Yeah. Um, most fashion models are thinner than 98% of American women. So, majority of people don't look like that, and even they don't look like that. 25% um, of American men, 45% of American women are on a diet on any given day. Americans spend over $40 billion on dieting and diet-related products every year. So the kind of energy and resources that we're putting into trying to make ourselves different, right? So again, we think about foot binding, and I think for many of us, the experience is, that seems so incomprehensible, so radical, how could you do that? And yet. What are the parallels in what we're doing today 
to make ourselves different, to make ourselves fit that, that ideal. So I wanted to take a moment to kind of think about that and, and in pairs, um, on the back side of that, that card, we have a place for, for a little recording of, of some ideas. I ask you to reflect on one or two ways that our culture's artificial and unattainable standards of beauty impact your life. And thinking, talking in pairs about the experience of watching that video, thinking about how that actually comes into your life and influences the way that you live. So um, now I'd like to ask you to, to spend another moment just in yourself thinking about three things in your life right now that your own sense of your body, your body image, how closely you do or don't conform to those artificial and unattainable standards. Is that keeping you from doing more of anything in your life that you would like to do? Does it keep you from, from going out dancing as much as you would like to? Does it keep you from asking for a raise? Does it, in what ways is the way that you see yourself as meeting or not meeting those ideals? Are there any ways that it, that it impacts you? Coming up with one or two or three if you can. And we're actually gonna come back to these in a, in a little bit. So right now we're just gonna ask you to write them down and hold on to them and we'll, we'll keep talking about them. We really dove into this thin body and how it impacts us, how it impacts community, the people that we, that we associate with. And so, you know, if we didn't listen to this myth that's being thrown in our faces 24 hours a day, what do we listen to? Where, what's our guide? You know, and so I invite us to go ahead and just, you know, put your packets aside and go ahead and just find a comfortable seat in your chair. And we're gonna turn just for a few minutes to our own inner guide. And so I invite you to just, you know, either close your eyes if you're comfortable or just have a gentle, you know, glance down to the floor. And we're just going to spend a couple minutes just getting quiet, quiet with ourselves. So just finding a cozy place and just noticing any maybe sensations in your body. For example, maybe the pressure of the back of the chair. Take a few breaths and imagine yourself coming home to your body. What do you notice now that you are home? If it is more helpful for you to think of moving out of your body and a new tenant moving into your body to observe this home, you know, please do so. Reflect for just a moment. What care does this body need? Does it need more rest? What is it telling you it needs for better nourishment? Maybe more liquids or physical touch? And when does this body need this? Does it need it in the morning? Maybe in the afternoon? Maybe right before bed? What tips or messages is this body expressing to you? And this might be very subtle, it might be very clear and profound. Just slowly bring yourself back, opening your eyes, and staying inside this experience, go ahead and open your folders to the <coughs> Breaking Body Miss 
um, positive, body positive exercise. This one right here. And go ahead and just spend, we're gonna spend, you know, a good amount of time here, you know, five, seven minutes, just going through this exercise on our own. Bringing any experiences maybe you just had, or new experiences that arrive as you work through this exercise. What are some things we can do differently to develop a, a, a healthier relationship to ourselves and our own bodies? These are uh, 10 examples that come from um, the National Eating Disorders uh, uh, Association. Um, I'll just read these. Is it in our packet? Yes, actually, it is. Um, it's in your packet. So you can appreciate all that your body can do. You got a little bit, maybe, of a taste of that from that body, uh, the exercise that, that Mackenzie just led you through. Um, you can keep a top 10 list of the things you like about yourself, uh, things that aren't related to how much you weigh or what you look like. Remind yourself that true beauty is not simply skin deep. Look at yourself as a whole person. Surround yourself with positive people. Shut down those voices in your head that tell you your body is not right or that you're a bad person. Wear clothes that are comfortable and that make you feel good about the body you have. Become a critical viewer of social and media messages. Do something nice for yourself, something that lets your body know you appreciate it. Massage, for example, bath. Use time and energy that you might have spent worrying about food, calories, and your weight to do something to help others. One thing that, uh, it, another thing you could do for yourself is to stop comparing, st stop the comparison game, stop comparing yourself to other people. And talk now about the third realm, which is societal. So what can we do um, to be more active in combating these, uh, these myths, these biases, at the greater and a society at large. Um, and maybe a, you know, an, an example could be to I'm show you in your packets, there's some, a resources list. Um, looks like this. I mean, one thing you could do is to actually join an organization uh, that focuses on the uh, promotion of a health at every health at every size model. Join an organization um, that that supports the attitudes, beliefs that you want to cultivate more of. Donate to an organization. And here's some organizations that that are actively combating weight discrimination and bias, promoting health at every size concepts, uh, health at every size, <clears throat> size acceptance, the National Association to Advance Fat Acceptance, for example. If you go to these websites, there's actually ways that you can get more involved in these organizations that can help you uh, kind of take a, do something that can help impact um, this movement at a larger level. What other things you know, that maybe you've done or you could imagine doing kind of at this I don't level? mean to monopolize, yeah. but um, I get emails from a particular restaurant. And this one time they announced that they were going to have one of those all-you-can-eat contests and who ate the most. And I was appalled. I wrote to the owner of the company and I said, considering the health issues in America today, this is unconscionable that you would sponsor such a thing. <laughs> and and uh, he wrote back to me and he said, he said, you're right, and we didn't really mean to do any harm, so something about they've scaled down the requirements for how much to eat, but when you see or hear something like that, speak up. Yeah. You know, I mean, I just, I just wrote to him and I said, this, this is unbelievable that you would support such a thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know the, how many pies you can eat, how many hot dogs you can eat, mm -hmm. and so forth. This yeah. happened to be sushi, but uh, mm -hmm. I was horrified. Yeah. Speak up. <coughs> yeah, use your voice. Yeah, sure. um, that's great. Yeah. I ordered a hamburger one time at Quarterback Lounge in Bellingham, and they told me, I'm sorry, the grill is occupied right now, because they had a, an eating contest for <laughs> a pound-sized burger, 
and so many people had ordered them that the grill was gridlocked. Uh, and if you finish the entire plate, you get a free t-shirt and your burger paid for it. If you live. <laughs> oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. I think another thing is to just to you know get out there and do things like bicycling and swimming no matter what your size and when you see people do that mm -hmm. maybe you'd be some with somebody that might make some kind of snide remark about their size don't be a part of that yeah, sure kind of thing and yeah, speak up say something yeah, yeah. exactly yeah Money has a lot of power in this in this society today, and you can um, feel empowered to spend your money in ways that in, uh, support the beliefs that you hold. That is a, a real way that you can feel empowered. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. So we've just started generating some of these strategies um, and um, in the realm of the, ourselves, uh, changing our relationships with friends and family and society at large. And so we've got some uh, great ideas today. I hope you can uh, even continue this discussion beyond our session today. I wanted to identify just a couple resources um, in addition to some of these strategies continuing this conversation. I mean, obviously you can do that with friends and family in your life, but if you'd like uh, um, assistance from professionals, I encourage you to um, consult the resources at the Basira Center for Natural Health. Our nutrition and counseling services um, are available. We're also going to be starting a weight management program called way to go uh, in the beginning of April. This is a nine-week weight management program that incorporates principles of health at every size, helps you make lifestyle changes um, that support the way that you want to live with and weight loss as a byproduct, but it's more about how changing, giving you support to change lifestyle uh, that in a way that's going to support your goals. Um, there's flyers in your handout for that. Other community resources, there's a Health at Every Size group that's actually starting today in Wallingford, um, but they'll be meeting on Saturdays at 11. There's a flyer for that <laughs> in your folder. And Mackenzie has her uh, private practice. She's got cards listed or on the back of the table. She's available for nutritional counseling. And um, we wanted to conclude with uh, a commitment from you um, to do one thing. What is one thing you could do 5% more of each day? Out of all, we've talked about a lot of different strategies today, a lot of ways you can think differently, maybe do things differently. We'd like to ask you to make a commitment to yourself to choose one thing you can do 5% more of each day. And to actually write that on the post-it note that Mackenzie just turned, handed out to you, and, and to then post that up here um, on your way out. And um, this will- It could also be less. It could, sure, <laughs> it could be more of or less of. That could support you know, the goals that you have yeah, less time the for yourself <laughs> that, that support a, a relationship with your own body that is uh, based on health wholeness. You might, uh, if you're, if you're, as you're thinking about this, you might look back at those three things that your body image right now is keeping you from. Maybe think about ways that you could, you could start there. You don't have to, but that's a, that's a place to consider. So while you're doing that, we're going to, we're going to give you some background, some background music and, and visual. Um, this is a, a video that was put together. We are that's very loud. We are a band of boys and strong. We are each girl who sings. That's consistent with this idea of, of kind of going out into the world, and it was a project to put positive images um, 
to share with each other about being beautiful exactly the way you are right now. You don't need to change to be an ideal. Just 